So move. It's not going to stop right now. So just uh, if you get dripped on, go ahead and take a different seat. But just want to welcome you this morning and your extremely heavy coats because last week it was 68 and this week it's 15. So, but welcome to River Oaks. My name is Josh Holstein and we are excited that you're here. Would you guys stand with me as I read our call to worship? comes from Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. 
O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Pray with me. Father, thank you that you are in control of all of that. God, I pray as we come together and sing and hear from your word and celebrate what you have done on the cross, Lord, that you would fill our hearts with joy and gladness everlasting. I pray this in your name. Amen. resolutions, but to me they're very interesting because they're a recognition that there's something in us or in our lives that is not good enough, that we, or that we don't like about ourselves. We want to change. 
And that's, in many ways, what this confession of sin is every week, recognition that there are still things in our lives that are not where we want them to be, that we want God to change in us. And so I'm going to pray this prayer of confession. It's like a lot of our uh, songs we sing. It's older language, and, um, but timeless truth. So let's pray. Almighty and merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We've left undone those things which we ought to have done. We have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare those, O oh God, who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of his holy name. Amen. Now, having confessed our sins, please stand and hear this wonderful promise from Psalm 32 that says, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Amen.
shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine. Will be forever.
know. And our children up to third grade are dismissed to children's, their classes. Good morning. My name is Jonathan Dorst. I'm one of the pastors here at River Oaks, where we uh, teach and believe that you are more sinful than you care to admit, but you are also more loved than you could ever imagine. And we stand on that truth. And uh, we also love having new people. So if this is your first time or you're new to River Oaks, we're so glad that you're here. We want to get to know you. Uh, We have pads on the end of every uh, row that we ask everybody to sign in. There's one side for members and one side for guests. Give us any information or prayer requests that you want us to know about and pray for. And there's also a QR code in your bulletin if you're a visitor and just let us know you're here. A few announcements. So obviously we just had one service this morning. Next Sunday we will go back to our regular rhythm of two services, 9 and 1045. Also next Sunday, between services, who knows what's happening? Yes. Congregational meeting, not budget, but we will be electing uh, elder candidate, elders that uh, you nominated the past, past fall. They were went through training, and now they're ready to be elected. But, so if you're a member, please be here between 1015 and 1045. Either stay late if you go to first or come early for second and uh, vote. It's very important. Uh, Youth group will not meet tonight, but we'll meet next Sunday, and women's Bible study will resume in a couple of weeks, the week of uh, January 16th. Uh, There's two main women Bible studies on Tuesday night and Wednesday morning. It's the same study, just for different times. Uh, We also have some men's Bible studies going on, smaller men's Bible studies, um, both in person and one that's going on online. Uh, So if you are interested in that, your man, let me know. I'd love to get you connected. Uh, in this new year. Okay, that's all the announcements I want to give, so there are more in the back of your bulletin, but let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we enter a new year, it's a reminder that your mercies are new every morning, and it's an opportunity for Or we got this microphone. There we go. Thank you, Josh. 2012 movie, The Avengers. Something happened in that movie that would have ripple effects for every Marvel movie and TV show moving forward, right? Afterwards that. And most of you know what this I'm talking about, right? The Battle of New York. Oh, we're good. Battle of New York was when, what happened? The skies opened up over downtown Manhattan and aliens came down to try to take over the earth and make Loki the ruler of the world. Now, up to that point, the people in the world did not know that there was life outside of the planet Earth, right? Didn't know there were aliens. And so even though the Avengers win the Battle of New York, There is this collective trauma among the survivors, not only what happened that day and the damage that was done, but also with this new knowledge that, indeed, there is life out there, that aliens are real, that a portal from heaven had been opened once and could be opened again. And there's a lot of plot lines and and movies and TV uh, shows that go into how do we stop that, right? How do we keep that from happening again? Now, of course, that's just a movie, but we're all fascinated with the question of 
is there life out there? Extraterrestrial life, alien life on other planets, right? I think we're also fascinated with this question of the supernatural. Is, is the supernatural real? Are there such things as angels and demons? Can they come to earth? In the first book of the Bible, in Genesis, we find out the scary but intriguing news that, yes, the supernatural is real, that there is actually a portal from heaven to earth, that angels, maybe even demons, can come up and down through. And this revelation comes in the middle of the story of a man named Jacob. And... Uh, so we're going to read just a part of his story in Genesis chapter 28. And so if you're able, please stand for this reading of God's word. Genesis 28, starting verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold... There was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. This is God's word for God's people and for the good of the world. Please be seated. Sometimes dreams are just dreams, but sometimes dreams communicate reality. And if you believe in the Bible at all, uh, you know that God sometimes uses dreams with people to communicate truth. Now, to understand why God gave Jacob this particular dream, we have to sort of understand a little bit of Jacob's background and his story, what he's doing here. Um, Jacob is... Uh, from a, he's on the run, right? He's, he's taken flight and he is, he's on the run from a very dysfunctional family. His, he is his mother's favorite, but his father, who's blind, has his favorite, his older twin brother Esau. And Jacob's mother, Rebecca, convinces Jacob to steal the family blessing from his older brother Esau. Because she doesn't think he's worthy of the family's blessing for various reasons. And Jacob does that, which is right in line with his character. Jacob is a deceiver. His very name means a usurper or supplanter. And so he usurps this blessing. And uh, when Esau finds out, he is livid that his rightful bless blessing has been taken away from him. And he vows to kill Jacob. And so Jacob runs, right? His, his only recourse is to get away from his brother and from his dysfunctional family. And he, so he finds himself out in the wilderness, on the run, completely estranged from those he loves the most. And he lies down to sleep, pretty lost and alone. Now, have you ever been that alone? Um, 
One of my favorite movies is Joe versus the Volcano. Yeah, some of you just said, oh, some of you said, yes. Very polarizing movie. You either love it or hate it. I love it. There's a scene in the movie where Joe is preparing to leave home and then he's going to make his way down to this, uh, an island in the South Pacific to jump in a volcano. Yeah, that's the, I can't defend the premise, the plot, but it's a great movie, okay? So he's, it's his last night in New York and uh, he's staying at this fancy hotel. He's just bought all these fancy clothes and luggage and it's the last night, and so he wants to go out in the town, but he doesn't know anybody, so he asks his driver, Marshall, if he'll have dinner with him. Well, Marshall has a family, has to get home. He says, I, I can't do that. And Marshall says, haven't you got anybody? And Joe says, no. But there are certain times in your life when I guess you're not supposed to have anybody, you know? Certain doors you have to go through alone. I think Joe's actually pretty wise here. Right? Now, now, sometimes loneliness happens because we have made a mess of relationships, or maybe sometimes because somebody has made a mess of us and excluded us from community. But sometimes loneliness happens because you have to be alone. Sometimes you're not supposed to have anybody, as Joe says. And I think, I believe the, these are the times that God uses to teach us about ourselves and to draw us into community or in a deeper relationship with him. And I think jo Jacob's loneliness was a combination of both, right? His relationships were a complete mess, but God was also using this lonely time to, to teach Jacob about himself and also to draw him closer to himself. So there, there he is. He's alone at night, sleeping out in the wilderness, and he has this vivid dream. Now, what is this dream? What is Jacob's dream about? It's a ladder. He dreams about a ladder, right? Stretching from earth to heaven. Angels going up and down on the ladder, and, and God is standing at the top of the ladder, and he's speaking to Jacob, and he tells Jacob that even though Jacob thinks he's alone, that he is not alone, that God is with him. Not only is he with him now, but he promises that he will continue to be with him, right? And just as God told Abraham, he tells Jacob that you are going to have a family. At this point, he's not married yet, right? You're going to have a family, and your descendants are going to be as numerous as the dust of the earth. And just like he told Abraham, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed through you. Quite a promise. And now for a lot of us, we wake up from a dream, we think, you know, it's just a dream. Shake it off, forget about it, go about real life. But when Jacob wakes, he realizes this is real life, right? God was with me. And speaking to me, and in verse 17, he says, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God and the gate of heaven. And then he sets up an altar, makes a vow to follow God and to give him a tenth of everything he owns. And so we see God revealing himself to Jacob. And as he does that, he is starting to change Jacob, right? He's changing him from someone who is a deceiver, someone who just takes, who steals, to someone who now begins to give, someone who begins to be able to worship, to, to live for God's glory rather than just his own glory. Well, people have been dreaming about spiritual things probably for as long as people have walked the earth, right? John Lennon had a dream that he wrote into a song called Imagine. These are the words, probably a lot of you are gonna have the tune in your head. It says, imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us, only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do, nothing to kill or die for, no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say, I'm a dreamer but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. 
a lot to unpack there. And the first thing I want to say is, I think we are certainly sympathetic to the idea that no one ought to be killed for their beliefs, right? Certainly something that John Lennon got right. People ought to be free to be able to believe and be able to change their beliefs. But the core of Lennon's beliefs here are that believing in God, believing in an afterlife, is what makes people dangerous, right? In, in his mind, believing that this world is all that there is is what makes peace possible. And the logic is here, if we would just see that life is just about people and loving people, right, rather than pleasing some demanding, wrathful God, then we would have a chance at peace. Now, the problem with that is actual experience, right? The scoreboard of history tells us that people who don't believe in God, who don't believe in an afterlife, have been some of the people who have been least interested in peace and most interested in power right now, right? People like Joseph Stalin, who is credited with killing maybe 20 million people. Or Mao Zedong, who killed maybe 70 million people, both atheists who didn't believe God, didn't believe in an afterlife, and were not interested in peace. Now, it is true that Christians have not always been peaceful. The Crusades are a particularly troubling part of our history. And it is also true that Christian theology says that there is sometimes time for a just war. Right, that begins with the premise of self-defense. But at the core of the Christian faith is the belief that God desires peace on earth and that we as Christians ought to work for peace. In fact, right, that's part of what the angels told the shepherds in the Christmas story. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to among those with whom he is pleased. Peace is important. And there are two kinds of peace that we need. The first is between people, between people groups. But the second, which maybe comes first, is a need for peace between heaven and earth, between God and humanity. And the reality of Jacob's ladder is that this peace is possible. Because there is a connection between heaven and earth, a ladder that can be climbed. The problem, though, that we learn from the rest of the Bible is that we can't do it. We can't climb the ladder. We're not strong enough. We're not good enough. Our hearts are inclined towards ourselves towards earth, towards violence, towards making war, whether physically or in our hearts. We cannot make our way up the stairway to heaven. We can't buy a stairway to heaven. And there's no way to get up by ourselves. All have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. And so the, the ladder, the reality of this Jacob's ladder is that we need God to come down the ladder to us. We need him to come down to rescue us, to bring us back up. And that's exactly what he did. In, uh, in John chapter 1, a man named Philip meets Jesus and becomes one of his disciples. And the, one of the first things he does is he goes and he finds his friend Nathaniel. And he says, Nathaniel, we found the one that Moses and the prophets talked about, Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel's skeptical. Nazareth? Come backwards town. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip says, hey, you just got to trust me. And so they go to find Jesus. And when Jesus sees Philip and Nathaniel coming, he greets Nathaniel by saying this. He says, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. That's a funny thing to say to someone you've never met before. Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And Nathaniel's like, you don't, you don't know me. But Jesus does know him. And he knows that Nathaniel is a student of the Old Testament. 
And so he drops this reference that he knows Nathaniel will know, right? An Israelite in whom there's no deceit, referring to an Israelite in whom there was deceit. Who's that? Jacob, right? And when Nathaniel realizes that Jesus knows him with some kind of supernatural knowledge, he begins to worship him. He says, you're the son of God. And then Jesus says, you think that's great? You will see greater things. And then he says this, he says, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Again, Jesus references Jacob and Jacob's ladder. But this time, he says that this ladder is not made of wood. It's made of flesh. Right? Son, who, it's the Son of God that is the ladder. The Son of God is a title that Jesus gives to himself over 80 times in the Gospels. What's he saying? He's saying that he is Jacob's ladder. He's saying, I am the stairway to heaven. He says, I am the only way to heaven. I am the, the mediator between heaven and earth. The only one who can make peace between God and humanity. As he says elsewhere, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. But you ask how? How could Jesus do that? How can he unite heaven and earth? Well, the answer is because he's the only one who came down the ladder from heaven, descended, and then ascended back up, right? That's, that is the meaning of Christmas, that God came down the ladder, descended uh, to us who were unable to ascend to him. Jonathan and Emily Martin, they're a musical duo in uh, Nashville. They they wrote and released an original Christmas album, and one of the songs on it struck me as illustrating this truth so well. It's called God Came Down to Us. We'd have no power, we'd have no strength to ever reach him, we'd never reach him. We'd have no hope if left on our own to ever find him. All of our will, all of our might could never reach his holy height. We could build a tower up to the sky, waste our lives trying to climb, or look with faith to the one who's called Emmanuel, coming down to raise us up with him. Emmanuel, can you believe it? God came down to us. Friends, Jesus is Jacob's ladder. And if you put your trust in him, you will have heaven open to you. See, every other religion teaches that we have to basically work our way up the ladder to get to God, to get to heaven. Now, the problem with that is that we're never really told how much we have to do, right? Like, how tall is the ladder? How many rungs is it? How many good works do I have to do? Right? And, and when I do bad, really bad things, how far down the ladder do I go? Do I have to start all over again? It's never clear. It's always some version of keep working, do the good things, and you will eventually work your way, and hopefully when you die, you'll go to heaven. See, only Christianity has certainties. The first certainty is that if you try to climb it yourself, you'll never make it. But the second certainty is that if you put your faith in Jesus, he will bring you up. And you will ascend based on his perfect work. It's a simple message for a new year. Do you want to go to heaven? You have to respond to the call of Christ and make him your Lord and Savior. That, that's the gospel, right? Now, if you reject the call of Christ, you need to realize what you are rejecting. You're not primarily rejecting the church and Christ the hypocrites of Christianity, right? We are a fine lot of hypocrites, if I do say so myself. But you are not primarily rejecting that. There are a lot of excuses people give for not submitting their lives to Christ. But when you reject the call of Christ, what you're rejecting is a person. 
You're rejecting Christ himself, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You're rejecting a Savior who's given himself for you as someone who can save you and love you in a way that no one else can. But if you accept him and follow him, all of heaven, all of eternity is opened to you. See, if, if you've never committed your life to Christ, today you stand at the gate of heaven as Jacob did. And the question is, will you choose eternal life or eternal death? And it's an eternal choice, but it also has consequences for now, right? Because coming to Christ changes how we live now because in Christ we have access to God. In, in the dream, he is up there, but in Christ, he is with us. So one application of that is prayer. How is, how is your prayer life? I know mine can get pretty stale. Sometimes I'm thinking, am I just saying words? Are they going anywhere, doing anything? So I want you to imagine this the next time you pray. I want you to imagine uh, your prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit going straight up the ladder to God. And God standing at the top of the ladder ready to answer and always offer you his presence. Your prayers matter in heaven. And another thing that changes now is that you are now responsible for having this knowledge about this pathway to heaven, right? And so we are tasked with telling people that there is a heaven, yes, the thing that they have wondered about. There is an afterlife. And the only way to get there is through a relationship with Jesus. We don't do it, we don't tell people out of duty, but out of joy and out of genuine concern for their eternal state. The ultimate gospel hope, though, as we think about Jacob's ladder, that we learn about in Revelation 21, though, is the end of the story, is that eventually, not only will we get to ascend the ladder to heaven, but that heaven will actually come down and join us. And at the end of time, that Jesus' work as the bridge between heaven and earth will be done, for heaven and earth will be one. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have not left us on our own to wonder about these spiritual things, to wonder if you're real, to wonder if there is a heaven and a hell, but you sent your only son to come, to be one of us, to live under the curse of the law and to die, to take the curse away from us and away from all of creation. And we await the day, and creation waits with groaning until the day when the sons of God will be revealed. And we look forward to the time when we will be with you in the new heavens and the new earth. Father, we pray that you would show us your glory and lead us uh, to sharing that good news with others as we share the hope of heaven. In the name of Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Well, Jacob's response to meeting God was to give a tenth of all that he owed back to God, and the Bible says that that is a good practice for Christians. And so in this new year, it's a great time to prioritize giving. Right? To have a system to give from the first fruits of what God has given uh, to you. Uh, Rachel and I used to, uh, we used to write our tithe check. That was our system. As soon as we got paid, we'd write that. would be the first check we wrote. I know nobody writes checks anymore, right? So one way to, to automate, to make it a priority is to automate your giving. Um, we are... We're still using Giving Fire. If you've been giving on Giving Fire, that's great. We're going to start to move to Realm. And so there's a 
whole part in the back of your bulletin, a QR code. If you, if you have not begun giving and would like to automate giving, you can do that here. If you would like to move your giving over from Giving Fire, you can do that. We're going to start to move there. Um, it'll be a slow process. We're, we're doing both, Giving Fire and Realm, but eventually we'll move to Realm. Uh, if you have a physical offering today, the deacons will pass around plates uh, during this song. And uh, we don't have total numbers from last year, but I know the giving was good, and so we thank you for your faithfulness to give. Let's stand and worship.
The Lord's Supper is a reminder that Jesus really did come down to us and that he gave his life as a ransom for many. The bread represents his body. The wine represents his blood that was shed for us, forgiveness of our sins. But it's not just a reminder. It is also a present and living token of our communion with God here and now and with Christ, that somehow spiritually, we might even say mystically, that we are communing with God as we eat this bread and this wine. And we are strengthening our faith in him as we do so. And uh, we, we remember Christ's time with his disciples in the upper room when he took bread and gave thanks and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the supper, he also took a cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And as often as you eat this bread, you drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ is coming again. And that we who are in Christ will meet him in the air. And so now Jesus, the bread of life, take a deep. The wine of the new covenant, take and drink. As our elders take their places at the four tables around the room, we want to invite you to come to this table. Um, this is a family meal. If you are a Christian, you're a part of the family. You don't have to be a member of our church, but you do have to be a Christian. You have to have responded to the invitation to join the family of God, to put your faith in Christ. If you are not there yet, this is a little chaotic the way we do it. If you're not ready to come to the table yet, that's okay. Just stay where you are, pray, think about what we've talked about this morning. We'd love to pray with you. Uh, Josh and I will be in the back and we'd love to pray with you. Uh, now, but now, please come to the table.
please stand and sing our final hymn. God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Go in peace.